Good afternoon, and welcome to our second reading from Fable Haven by Brandon Mall. If you remember from last week, um, Kendra and Seth, two children, have been sent to live with their grandparents and while well, their mother and father are off on a cruise. And Grandpa has given them strict instructions that they have full reign of the lawn and the, and the pool and their playroom. However, they are not to go into the old barn and they are not to go into the woods. And he has told them that they can't go into the woods because it's tick season and they may get Lyme disease. Um, and so far, Kendra has obeyed the rules. However, in this chapter that we're going to need to read, called The Ivy Shack, Chapter 3, Seth is going into the woods and disobeying his grandfather. Seth pressed through dense over undergrowth until he reached a faint, crooked path, the kind made by animals. Nearby stood a squat, gnarled tree with thorny leaves and black bark. Seth examined his leaves for ticks, scrutinizing the camouflage pattern. So far, he had not seen a single tick. Of course, it would probably be the ticks that he failed to see that would get him. He hoped the insect repellent he had sprayed on was helping. Stooping, he collected rocks and built a small pyramid to mark the point where he had intersected the path. Finding his way back would probably be no problem, but better safe than sorry. If he took too long, Grandpa might figure out he had disobeyed orders. Rubbaging in his cereal box, Seth withdrew a compass. The animal track ran northeast. He had set off on an easterly course, but the undergrowth had grown denser as he progressed. A faint trail was a good excuse to veer slightly off course. It would be much easier than going trying it would be much easier going than trying to hack his way through shrubbery with a pocket knife. He wished he had owned a machete. Seth followed the trail. The tall trees stood fairly close together, diffusing the sunlight into a greenish glow laced with shadows. Seth imagined that the forest would be black as a cave after nightfall. Something rustled in the bushes. He paused, removing a small pair of plastic binoculars from his cereal box. Scanning the area, he spotted nothing of interest. He proceeded along the trail until an animal emerged from the undergrowth onto the path not 20 feet ahead. It was a round, bristly creature no taller than his knees, a porcupine. The animal started down the path in his direction with complete confidence. Seth froze. The porcupine was close enough that he could discern the individual quills, slender and sharp. As the animal trundled toward him, Seth backed away. Weren't animals supposed to flee from humans? Maybe it had rabies. Or maybe it just hadn't seen him. After all, he's wearing a camouflage shirt. Seth spread his arms wide, stomped a foot, and growled. The porcupine looked up, twitched its nose, and then turned from the path. Seth listened as it pushed through the foliage away from the trail. He took a deep breath. He had really been scared for a minute there. He could almost feel the quills prickling through his jeans into his leg. It would be pretty hard to conceal his excursion into the woods if he came home looking like a pincushion. Though he dreaded admitting it, he wished Kendra, Kendra had come. The porcupine probably would have made her scream, and her fear would have increased his bravery. He could have made fun of her instead of feeling frightened himself. He had never seen a porcupine in the wild before. He was surprised how exposed he felt staring at all those pointy quills. What if he stepped on one in the undergrowth? He looked around. He had come a long way. Of course, finding his way back would be no trick. He just needed to backtrack along the trail and then head west. But if he turned home for now, he might never make it back this way again. Seth continued along the trail. Some of the trees had moss and lichen growing on them. A few had ivy twisting around the ba their bases. The path forked. Checking his compass, Seth said that one path went northwest, the other due east. Staying with his theme, Seth turned east. There began to be more space between the trees, and the shrubs grew closer to the ground. Soon he could see much farther in all directions, and the forest became a little brighter. To one side of the path, at the limit of his sight, he noticed something abnormal. It looked like a large square of ivy hidden among the trees. The whole point of exploring the woods was to find strange things, so he left the path and he walked toward the ivy square. The dense undergrowth came up to his shins, grasping at his ankles with every step. As he tromped toward the square, he realized it was a structure completely overgrown with ivy. It appeared to be a big shed. He stopped and looked more closely. The ivy was thick enough that he could not tell what the shed was made of. He could only see leafy vines. He walked around the structure. 
On the far side, a door stood open. Seth almost cried out when he peered inside. The shed was actually a shack constructed around a large tree stump. Beside the stump, dressed in crude rags, sat a wiry old woman gnawing at a knot in a bristly rope. Shriveled with age, she clutched the rope in bony hands with knobby knuckles. Her long white hair was matted and had a sickly yellowish tint. One of her filmy eyes was terribly bloodshot. She was missing teeth and there was blood on the knot she was chewing, apparently from her gums. Her pale arms, pale off, there almost to the shoulder, were thin and wrinkled with faint blue veins and a few purple scabs. When the woman saw Seth, she dropped the rope immediately, wiping pink saliva from the corners of her meager lips. Supporting herself against the stump, she stood up. He noticed her long feet, the color of ivory, peppered with insect bites. Her gray toenails looked thick with fungus. Hail, young master, what brings you to my home? Her voice was incongruously melodious and smooth. For his moment, Seth could only stare. Even as bent and crooked as she was, the woman was tall. She smelled bad. You live out here? He finally said, I do. Care to come inside? Probably not. I'm just out for a walk. The woman narrowed her eyes. Strange place for a woman, a boy, to walk alone. I like exploring. My grandpa owns this land. Owns it, you say? Does he know you're here? asked Seth. Depends who he is. Seth Stan Sorensen. She grinned. He knows. The rope she had chewed laid on the dirt floor. It had one other knot beside the one she had been gnawing. Why are you biting the rope? Seth asked. She eyed him suspiciously. I don't care for knots. Are you a hermit? You can say that. Come inside and I'll brew some tea. I better not. She looked down at her hands. I must look frightful. Let me show you something. She turned and crouched behind the stump. A rat ventured a few steps out of a hole in the corner of the dark. When she came back from behind the stump, the rat hid. The old woman sat with her back to the stump. She held a little wooden, wooden puppet about nine inches high. It looked primitive, made entirely of dark wood with no clothes or painted features. Just a basic human figure with teeny gold hooks serving as joints. The puppet had a stick in its back. The woman set a paddle on her lap. She began making the puppet dance by bobbing the stick and tapping the paddle. There was a musical regularity to the rhythm. What is that thing? Seth asked. A lumberjack she replied. Where's his axe? Not a lumberjack, a limberjack. A clog doll, a jigger, dancing Dan, shuffling Sam. I call him Mendigo. He keeps me company. Come inside and I'll let you give it a try. I better not, he said again. I don't see how you could live out here like this and not be crazy. Sometimes good people grow weary of society. She sounded a little annoyed. You happened upon me by accident, out exploring? Actually, I'm selling candy bars for my soccer team. It's a good cause, she stared at him. I have the, my best luck in rich neighborhoods, she kept staring. That was a joke, I was kidding. Her voice became stern. You are an impudent young man. And you live with a tree stump, she gave him a measuring glare. Very well, my arrogant young adventurer. Why not test your courage? Every explorer deserves a chance to prove his mettle. The old woman withdrew into the shack and crouched behind the stump again. She returned to the doorway holding a crude, narrow box made of splintered wood, wire, and long jutting nails. What's that? Place your hand inside the box to prove your valor and earn a reward. I'd rather play with the creepy puppet. Just reach inside and touch the back of the box. She shook it and it rattled a bit. The box was long enough that he would have to put reach in with his to his elbow in order to touch the back. Are you a witch? A man with a brave tongue should support his words, words with courageous actions. This seems like something a witch would do. Stand by your loose words, young man, or you may not have a pleasant journey home. Seth backed away, watching her closely. I better get going. Have fun eating your rope. She clucked her tongue. Such insolence. Her voice remained soothing and calm, but now held a menacing undertone. Why not step inside and have some tea? Next time, 
Seth moved around the shack, not taking his eyes from the ragged woman in the doorway. She made no move to pursue him. Before he moved out of sight, the woman raised an arthritic hand with the middle fingers crossed and the others bent awkwardly. Eyes half shut, she appeared to be murmuring something. Then she was out of view. On the far side of the shack, Seth plunged through the tangled undergrowth back to the path, glancing over his shoulder all the way. The woman was not chasing him. Just looking back at the ivory-colored shack made him shiver. The old hag looked so wretched and smelled so foul. There was no way he was sticking his hand in her weird box. After she had offered the challenge, all he could think about was learning in school how shark teeth angled inward so fish could swim in but not out. He imagined the homemade box was probably full of nails or broken glass set at crude angles for a similar purpose. Even though the woman was not following him, Seth felt unsafe. Compass in hand, he hurried along the path toward home. Without warning, something struck him on the ear, barely hard enough to sting. A pebble the size of a thimble dropped to the path at his feet. Seth whirled. Somebody could have thrown a little stone at him, but he saw nobody. Could the old woman be stealthily following him? She probably knew the woods really well. Another small object bounced off the back of his neck. It was not as hard or heavy as a stone. Turning, he saw another acorn whistling toward him, and he ducked. The acorns and pebble had come at him from opposite sides of the path. What was going on? From above came the sound of wood splinting, and a huge limb fell across the path behind him, a few leaves and twigs swishing him against him as it passed. If Seth had been standing two or three yards back along the path, a branch thicker than his leg would have clubbed him on the head. One look at the heavy limb, limb and Seth took off down the path at full sprint. He seemed to hear rustling sounds coming from the shrubbery on either side of the scant trail, but he did not slow down to investigate. Something caught him, caught a firm hold on his ankle, sending him tumbling to the ground. Sprawled on his belly, a cut in one hand, dirt in his mouth, he heard something rustling through the foliage behind him and a strange sound that was either laughter or running water. A dry branch snapped like a gunshot, not looking back for fear of what he might see. Seth scrambled to his feet and dashed along the path. Whatever had tripped him had not been a root or a stone. It had felt like a strong cord stretched across the trail, a tripwire. He had noticed no such trap previously on the path. But there was no way the old woman could have done it, even if she had started running the moment he passed out of her view. Seth ran past the place where the trail forked and sprinted back the way he had come. He scanned the trail ahead for wires or other traps. His breathing became labored, but he did not slow down. The air felt hotter and more humid than it had all day. Sweat began to dampen his forehead and drip down the sides of his face. Seth remained alert for the little pyramid of rocks that would mark where he should leave the path. When he reached a gnarled little tree with black bark and thorny leaves, he halted. He remembered the tree. He had noticed it when he intersected the path. Using the tree as a reference, he found the spot where he had built the pyramid of rocks, but his rocks were gone. Leaves crunched behind him off to one side of the trail. Seth glanced at his compass to confirm that he was heading west and ran into the woods. He had walked this way at a leisurely pace, examining toadstools and unusual rocks as he went. Now he tore through the forest at full speed, undergrowth clawing at his legs, branches whipping against his face and chest. Finally, Panting the energy of his panic wearing thin, he glimpsed the house up ahead through the trees. The sounds of pursuit had dwindled to nothing. As he stepped out into the yard under the sun, Seth wondered how much of what he had heard had actually been something chasing him and how much had been invented by his flustered imagination. The wall opposite the windows in the playroom held several rolls of bookshelves. The door to the stairs was built into that wall and one of the bulky freestanding wardrobes was backed up against it. Kendra held a blue book with golden letters. The title was Journal of Secrets. The book was held shut by three sturdy clasps, each with a keyhole. The remaining key Grandpa Sorensen had given her fit none of the keyholes, but the gold key she had found in the dollhouse armor fit the bottom one, so one of the clasps was unlocked. She had found the book while searching the bookshelves for a trigger to a secret passage. Using a stool, Kendra had searched reached even the higher shelves, but so far the search had been in vain. There was no sign of a secret door. When she noticed a locked book with an intriguing title, 
She put the search in order to test her keys. With the bottom clasp unlocked, Kendra tried to pry up the corner of the book and get a peek, but the cover was solid and the binding firm. She needed to find the other keys. She heard somebody stampeding up the stairs and knew it could only be one person. Hurriedly, she shelved the book and pocketed the keys. She did not want her nosy brother interfering with her puzzle. Seth changed, charged through the door and slammed it behind him. He was flushed and breathing hard. Dirt smeared the knees of his jeans. His face was smudged with sweat and grime. You should have come, he sighed, flopping onto his bed. You're getting the bedspreads filthy. It was freaky, he said. It was so cool. What happened? I found the path in the woods and met this weird old lady who lived in a shack. I think she's a witch. A real one. Whatever. He rolled over and looked at her. I'm serious. You should have seen her. She was a mess. So are you. No, I call scabby and gross. She was biting an old rope and she tried to make me stick my hand in some box. Did you? No way, I took off, but she chased me or something. She threw rocks at me and knocked down this big branch. Could have killed me. You must be pretty bored. I'm not lying. I'll ask Grandpa Sorensen if he has homeless people living in this woods, Kendra said. No, he'll know I broke the rules. Don't you think he would want to know a witch built a shack and was on his property? She acted like she knew him. I went pretty far. Maybe I was off his property. I doubt it. I think he owns everything for a long ways. Seth leaned back, lacing his fingers behind his head. You should come visit with her with me. I could find my way back. Are you nuts? You said she tried to kill you. We should spy on her, find out what's going on. If there really is a weird old lady living in the trees, you should tell Grandpa so he can call the police. Seth set up. Okay, never mind. I made it up. Feel better? Kendra narrowed her eyes. Found something else cool, Seth said. Have you seen the tree house? No. Want me to show you? Is it in the yard? Yes, on the edge. Okay. Kendra followed Seth outside and across the lawn. Sure enough, in the corner of the yard opposite the barn, there was a light blue playhouse up in a thick tree. It was situated on the back side of the tree, making it hard to see most from the yard. The paint was peeling a little, but the little house had shingles on the roof and curtains down the window. Boards had been nailed into the tree to form a ladder. Seth went up first. The rungs led to a trap door, which he pushed open. Kendra climbed up after him. Inside, the tree house felt bigger than it looked from the ground. There was a little table with four chairs. The pieces to a jigsaw puzzle were spread out on the table. Only a couple had been fit together. See, not bad, Seth said. I started that puzzle. It's beautiful. You must be gifted. I didn't work on it long. Did you even find the corners? No. That's the first thing you do. She sat down and started looking for corner pieces. Seth took a seat and helped. I never liked puzzles, Kendra said. It's more fun doing them in a treehouse. If you say so. Seth found a corner piece and set it aside. I think Grandpa would let me move in here. You're a weirdo. I'd only need a sleeping bag, he said. You'd get freaked out once it was late. No way. The witch might come get you. Instead of responding, he started looking more intently for the other corner pieces. Kendra could tell the comment had gotten to him. She decided not to tease him any further. The fact that he seemed scared of the old lady he had met in the woods legitimized his story a lot. Seth had never scared easily. This was a kid who had jumped off the roof under the misguided assumption that a garbage bag would work with a parachute. The kid who had put the head of a live snake in his mouth on a dare. They found the corners and finished most of the perimeter of the puzzle by the time they heard Lena calling them for dinner. Chapter 4 The Hidden Pond Rain pattered endlessly against the roof. Kendra had never heard such a noisy downpour. Then again, she had never been in an attic during a rainstorm. There was something relaxing about the steady drumming, so constant that it almost became inaudible without decreasing in volume. Standing at the window beside the telescope, she watched the deluge. The rain fell straight and hard. There was no wind, just layer upon layer of streaking droplets blurring into a gray haze in the distance. The gutter below her was about to overflow. Seth sat on a stool in the corner painting. Lena had been creating paint-by-numbers canvases for him, sketching them with expert speed, customizing each image to his specifications. The current project was a dragon battling a knight on horseback amid a fuming wasteland. Lena had outlined the images in considerable detail, including subtleties of light and shade, so that the finished product looked quite accomplished. 
She taught Seth how to mix paint and given him samples of which hue corresponded to which number. For the current painting, she incorporated more than 90 different shades. Kendra had rarely seen Seth demonstrate so much diligence as he did with the paintings. After a few brief lessons on how to apply the paint, including the purposes of different brushes and tools, he had already finished a large canvas of pirates sacking a town and a smaller one of a snake charmer diving away from a striking cobra. Two impressive paintings in three days. He was an addict, and he was almost done with his latest project. Crossing to the bookshelf, Kendra ran a hand along the spines of the volumes. She had searched the room thoroughly and had yet to find the last keyhole, let alone a secret passage to the other side of the attic. Seth could be a pest, but now that he would become immersed in his paintings, she was starting to miss him. Maybe Lena would outline a painting for her. Kendra had turned down the initial offer since it, since it sounded childish. What coloring? But the finished projects looked so much less juvenile than Kendra had anticipated. Kendra opened the door and descended down the stairs. The house was dim and quiet, the rainfall more distant as she left the attic behind. She walked along the hall and down the stairs to the main floor. The house seemed too quiet. All the lights were out, were out despite the gloom. Lena? There was no answer. Kendra went through the living room, the dining room, and into the kitchen. No sign of the housekeeper. Had she left? Opening the door to the basement, Kendra peered down the steps into the darkness. The stairs were made of stone, as if leading to a dungeon. Lena? She called out uncertainly. Surely the woman wasn't down there without any light. Kendra went back down the hall and slid open the door to the study. Having not yet entered this particular room, she first noticed the huge desk cluttered with books and papers. The massive head of a hairy boar with jutting tusks hung mounted on the wall. A collection of grotesque wooden masks rest on a shelf. Golfing trophies lined another. Plaques decorated the wood paneled walls along with a framed display of military medals and ribbons. There is a black and white picture of a much younger Grandpa Sorensen showing off an enormous marlin. On the desk, inside a crystal sphere with a flat bottom, was an eerie replica of a human skull, no bigger than her thumb. Kendra slid the study door closed. She tried the garage, the parlor, and the family room. Maybe Lena had gone to the store. Kendra walked out to the back porch, shielded from the rain by the overhang. She loved the fresh, damp scent of rainfall. It continued to come down hard, puddling around the garden. Where do butterflies hide in such a downpour? Then she saw Lena. The housekeeper knelt in the mud beside a bush blossoming with large blue and white roses, absolutely soaked, apparently weeding. Her white hair was plastered to her head and her house coat was drenched. Lena? The housekeeper looked up, smiled, and waved. Kendra retrieved an umbrella from the hall closet and joined Lena in the garden. You're sobbing, Kendra said. Lena rooted down a weed. It's a warm rain. I like being out in this weather. She stuffed the weed into a golden garbage bag. You're going to catch a cold. I don't often take ill. She paused to stare up at the clouds. It won't last much longer. Kendra tilted her umbrella back and gazed heavenward, blood and skies in all directions. You think? Wait and see. The rain will pass within the hour. Your knees are all muddy. You think I've lost my marbles. The diminutive woman stood up and spread her arms wide, tilting her head back. Did you ever look up at the rain, Kendra? It feels like the sky is falling. Kendra tilted the umbrella back again. Millions of raindrops rushed toward her, some pelting her face and making her blink. Or like you're soaring up to the clouds, she said. I suppose I should get you inside before my unusual habits rub off. No, I didn't mean to disturb you. Back under the protection of the umbrella, Kendra wiped droplets off her forehead. Guess you don't want the umbrella. That would defeat the purpose. I'll be in shortly. Kendra returned to the house. She stole glances at Lena through a window. It was just so peculiar. She couldn't resist spying. Sometimes Lena was working. Sometimes she was smelling a blossom or stroking its petals, and the rain kept falling. Kendra was sitting on her bed, reading poems by Shel Silverstein, when the room suddenly brightened. The sun was out. Lena had been right about the rain. It had relented about 40 minutes after her prediction. The housekeeper had come inside, changed out of her wet clothes, and made sandwiches. Across the room, the painting of the night charging the dragon was complete. Seth had gone outside an hour ago. Kendra was in a lazy mood. Just as Kendra returned her attention to the latest poem, Seth burst into the room, breathing hard. He wore only socks and his feet. His clothes were streaked with mud. You have to come to see what I found in the woods. Another witch? No, way cooler. A hobo camp? I'm not going to say. 
You have to come. Does it involve hermits or lunatics? No people, he said. How far from the yard? Not far. We could get in trouble. Besides, it's muddy out. Grandpa is hiding a beautiful park in the woods, Seth blurted. What? asked Kendra. You have to come see it. Put on galoshes or something. Kendra closed the book. After sunlight came and went, depending on the shifting clouds, a soft breeze ruffled the foliage. The wood smelled mulchy. Scrambling over a damp, rotting log, Kendra shrieked when she saw a glistening white frog. Seth turned around. Awesome. Try disgusting. I've never seen a white frog, said Seth. He tried to grab it, but the frog took an enormous leap as he approached. Whoa, that thing flew. He checked the underbrush where the frog had landed, but found nothing. Hurry up, Kendra said, glancing back the way they had come. The house was no longer in sight. She could not shake the sick, nervous feeling in her stomach. Unlike her little brother, Kendra was not a natural rule breaker. She was in all of the accelerated classes at school, got almost perfect grades, kept her room tidy, and always practiced her piano lessons. Seth, on the other hand, settled for lousy grades, routinely skipped his homework, and earned frequent detentions. Of course, he was also the one with all the friends, so maybe there was a method to his madness. What's the rush? He took the lead again, blazing a trail through the undergrowth. The longer we're gone, the more likely somebody will notice we're missing. Isn't much further. See that hedge? It was not exactly a hedge, more like a tall barrier of unkempt bushes. He called that a hedge? The park is on the far side. The wall of bushes extended as far as Kendra could see in either direction. How do we get around? Through it, you'll see. They reached the bushes and Seth turned left, studying the leafy barricade as he went, occasionally squatting and checking closer. The interlocked bushes ranged from 10 to 12 feet tall, and they looked really thick. Okay, I think this is where I squirmed through. There was a deep indentation at the base of where two bushes overlapped. Seth dropped to all fours and forced his way in. You're going to have a billion ticks, Kendra predicted. They're all hiding from the rain, he replied with perfect confidence. Kendra got down and followed him. I don't think this is the same way I got through the last time. It's a little more cramped, but it should work. Now he was slithering on his belly. This better be good. Kendra squirmed on her elbows, eyes squinted. The damp ground felt cold and droplets fell from the bush as she jostled it. Seth reached the far side and stood up. She crawled through as well, her eyes widening as she got to her feet. Before her lay a pristine pond, a couple of hundred yards across, with a small burning island in the center. A series of elaborate gazebos surrounded the pond, interconnected by a whitewashed boardwalk. Flowering vines wound along the lattice work, work of the impressive promenade. Elegant swans glided on the water. Butterflies and hummingbirds wove and darted among the blossoms. On the far side of the pond, peacocks strutted and preened. What in the world? Kendra gasped. Come on. Seth started across the lush, nearly mown lawn toward the nearest gazebo. Kendra looked back, understanding why Seth had called the disheveled barrier of bushes a hedge. On this side, the bushes were neatly trimmed. The hedgerow encompassed the entire area with a single arched entryway off to one side. Why didn't we come through the entryway? Kendra asked, trotting after her brother. Shortcut. Seth paused at the white steps leading up to the gazebo to pull up a piece of fruit from an escalator. Try one. You should wash it. It just rained. He took a bite. It's so good. Kendra tried one. It was the sweetest nectarine she'd ever tasted. Delicious. Together they mounted the steps of the extravagant pavilion. The wood railing was perfectly smooth. Although unshielded from the elements, all the woodwork appeared to be flawless condition, no peeling paint, no cracks, no splinters. The gazebo was furnished with white wicker love seats and chairs. In some places, the, the, the ubiquitous vines had been woven into living wreaths and other fanciful patterns. A bright parrot sat on a high porch staring down at them. Look at the parrot! Kendra exclaimed. Last time I saw monkeys, Seth said, little guys with long arms. They were swinging all over the place, and there was a goat. It ran away as soon as it saw me. And here is a picture of the gazebos. Seth took off, clumping down one of the boardwalks. Kendra followed more slowly, absorbing the scene. It looked like the setting of a fairy tale wedding. She counted 12 pavilions, each unique. One had a small quay projecting into the pond. The little pier was connected to a floating shed that had to be a boathouse. 
Kendra strolled after Seth, whose ruckus was sending the swans drifting toward the far side of the lake, leaving V-shaped ripples in their wake. The sun broke through the clouds and gleamed upon the water. Why did Grandpa Sorensen keep a place like this a secret? It was magnificent. Why go through all the trouble of maintaining it if not to enjoy it? Hundreds of people could gather here with room to spare. Kendra went to the gazebo with the pier and found that the boathouse was locked. It was not large. She guessed it held a few canoes or rowboats. Maybe Grandpa Sorensen would give them permission to paddle around the pond. No, she could not even tell them she knew about this place. What? Was that why you told them about the ticks and made rules against entering into the woods to keep his little Eden hidden? Would he be so selfish and secretive? Kendra finished a complete lap around the pond, walking on clean wooden planks the entire way. Across the pond, Seth yelled, and a small flock of cockatoos took flight. The sun retreated behind the clouds. They needed to get back. Kendra told herself she would return later. And this looks like a good stopping place. Um, I hope you'll continue to read this book. Remember that it is available um, either in a book form, you can place a hold for it, or it is available through our Hoopla app. Um, again, this book is the first in a series. It's called Fable Haven, and there are um, three more in the series. And then there is also a new adventure set in the same world as Fable Haven called Dragon Watch. And attached to this video will be some activity sheets that Shadow, Mass Shadow Mountain Publishing has shared with us that I hope you'll enjoy. Um, and next week we'll do a new book, so stay tuned and thank you for listening.